I am waiting for the recording to start. I think it started. It just started. prompted a like tune. Ah, here we go from my side too. I'm slow. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to another TOS Tech Talk session. Uh, our newest team member today um, will facilitate the meeting. So Maya, take take it away. If you have questions, ask them. Right. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, so where can I find the, find the Google Doc we usually use for uh, the session? Oh, thank you. Perfect. So okay, so we're November fourth, and um, so the first the first topic is. Uh, presented by Christoph. Uh, so uh, is this the one with the GitHub link or is it the second one with solving the uh, arc? It's uh, actually the, the link to the pull request. Um, I started fiddling around with uh, tiny scripts to manage the deployment that we have in every repository of GitHub. So uh, I think we we um, we sometimes had the question: What version is deployed? What 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 version of Kabashet did open this issue on the support repository? One way is um, obviously to attach the version information to the issue itself, but um, GitHub offers us a way to really um, track deployments. So when uh, what you could deploy is every commit, and you are deploying uh, a commit to an environment. And every deployment has a status or a state it is in. So you could do something like uh, I'm deploying the head of a repository to the test environment, and the deployment is in progress because something started to do this stuff. And later on, you're gonna send um, uh, an API call to GitHub and say uh, the head or this specific deployment I created earlier has successfully finished or it failed. All that information is um, is stored in GitHub, and that might be useful because it gives us a pretty um, pretty easy way to see which version is deployed in what environment. Um, if I add another link to the document and it's on that link, we can see that thing somehow in action, right? There's different deployments to different environments. Uh, in this case, I, I'm, I'm just testing around, right? It's not really deploying anything. In this case, it is deploying a tag, like like a version tag, or uh, the first one is a branch uh, that has been deployed, just to figure it out. Um, so the goal is, um, if, if we have tiny scripts, which can set these statuses, can we have um, the Argo CD um, application to send out notifications to set these status. Uh, in Argo CD, you can run a hook if a deployment starts, and you can run a hook if a deployment was successfully or unsuccessfully finished. So taking the scripts, uh, we could set the deployment status on GitHub. That way, as in this example, if you scroll up, um, Hashart, a little bit, please, you can see that uh, source ops testing repository um, version tech uh, 2019 blah 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 has been successfully tested uh, has been successfully deployed to the test environment maybe that's a faster way to to do all that things i'm a little bit unsure about the integration into argo cd for tecton if we would use tecton for deploying our stuff for tecton there's pre-built tasks to do so which could be integrated into a Tecton pipeline. That's just um, um, that I'm fiddling around with that stuff a little bit. Maybe it's an easier way for us to really keep track of what is deployed in which environment. 
hopefully we can get rid of uh, Hasha's wonderful table in that, um, uh, or at least generate parts of the table automatically. That was uh, just an information. It's supposed to run in our workflow? Uh, a script <laughs> that you run? It's a script. Um, so I put it in the workflow helpers because it felt like a good place. Mm. If if we put it no then move it out. Um, if we put it in there, we we have one container images which is helping our workflows. If you think it's too uh, DevOps oriented, uh, we move it to a different one. Um, but if we want to use it with Argo CD hooks or with Tekton tasks, we need to put it in some container image. It's a script that could be yeah either either executed by Argo. Or by um, Tekton. Okay. And it has no, no magic in there uh, somehow. So one, one question or comment. Uh, right now, the, the, the chatbot is already somehow, I, I don't know the details, I should make comment, but the chatbot does let us know when. When there is a deployment to stage test, etc., I guess that could be the place to expand, maybe, or I mean, yeah, not to duplicate. Yeah, exactly. It's the same Argo CD failure or success hook that would not only talk to Google Chat in that case, but also to GitHub. I think there are multiple interaction points. The one Pep is talking about is the Kebeshit release. When Kebeshit releases, uh, we send out a, a text or a notification saying version 1.x has been yes. released. And that, that basically just is an hook. Oh, sorry. That is the notification to the point that there was a release happening in GitHub. Uh, I think this one is more like it's deployed, which is also a hook in how what Christoph just said. But uh, so this will run every time. My question, sorry, uh, to bother you, like, but this will get deployed after every deployment. Is that what it is? So this is for source of uh, testing to understand correctly. Next time when we release Kebishet, we go to Kebishet deployments and it will show you Kebishet version 1.6.2 is deployed. Is that what it is? Yes, uh, correct. So, so uh, obviously the source ops uh, testing is a little bit cluttered. Uh, that is why you see all the crap. Um, but yeah, the go the goal or the, that that was um, my point, which I take took away from from a few discussions. If we could go head over to Kebeshed and really see, okay, um, here is a deployment of Kebeshed one five five to the production environment that is active and it points back to the Argo CD application and it points back to the uh, version tag. That way we would have all the deployment relevant information in one place. Just think about it. As, uh, as you can see in the source ops repository, I've been playing around that like two years ago. Um, maybe um, this time I will move forward, more, more forward. If we figure out it's not useful, well, then we don't do it anyways. Just to let all you guys know what's what's happening. And what's the difference uh, between this solution and the job that is triggered once, like dot chat notification uh, that is uh, run each time there's deployment done? Um, uh, there's no difference. Um, so the, the, the chat notification is coming out of um, Argo CD uh, hook that is run on successful or failed deployment. And that same hook would also send the information to GitHub. It, from my point of view, it's just a different uh, medium or channel we are feeding the same information into. Either you're going to scroll back and look at the chat, or you're going to have a look at the Git repository and see what's deployed. Or you're going to have a look at uh, Hashard's table and see what's deployed. Or 
you're going to have a look at um, the Toth application and see, uh, repository and see what should be deployed. Uh, so that means that Python script that is run will eventually land in uh, the dot notification YAML file. Is that correct? Like here, I've sent uh, a link yes. to. Exactly. Um, exactly. I don't. Uh, so, so my assumption was that I can simply extend that job to have another container. Right, you, you see line uh, 49, for example, um, that is one of the containers that is run by the job. And that job is run on, the specific job is run on success. Mm -hmm. So I would just add another container, which is pointing to the workflow helpers container image, which is calling the script, the Python script. Make sense somehow, or just sparking more question? I mean, it makes sense to me. Um, so, for sure, what do you think would, would it be helpful? I mean, uh, it's a good process. Uh, it would be helpful for someone, like some people. We can definitely do it yes. right here. I have a yes, yes, yes. Where is the issue for it? <laughs> um, I think in the same repository where all the roads related issues are. <laughs> so, so I'm uh, I'm I'm not spending that much time on it. Um, so it's uh, a for me an exercise to to keep on thinking about uh, source code, and b uh, not not really moving this forward and plan it into a sprint. But Hashad, of course, you're right. There's no issue for that stuff. I'm just joking. Uh, but we, yeah, we can definitely add this. Uh, as yeah. you said, like uh, add it in the container, run it. Uh, so we are not running it. It will run on sync success, or post yes. success. Uh, Let, let's see how that works out. Um, as I said, to me, I'm, I'm focusing on the question, what stuff is running? Uh, I have the same problem we have had for Kevishet on uh, Zefgate Abvi. So I'm always unsure uh, which container image is up and running. And I'm way too lazy to head over to the OpenShift cluster and log in and move to the namespace and really have a look at the deployment and maybe trace back the container image being used and blah, 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 blah. It would be cool to just head over to the Zefgate Abvi repository on GitHub and see, ah, in test environment, version one two three is deployed, and in production, one two five is deployed. Makes sense. Yes. Um, yeah. If if maintainers are maintaining one or two repositories, they shouldn't be concerned about others. So that makes sense to have it this way. But so where, so does it have a UI button, or do we have to? Or does it show in environment, or we have to always go for deployments? Uh, I think click on environment. I think that is it. And yeah. and um. So this is, yeah, this should be good. You should see, if you go back one click, um, you see this environment section only if some deployments have taken place. And you see the most current environment state over there. So it is like, <laughs> at least what I hope, it is like an immediate, um, uh, benefit because you don't have to click around. You just head over to the Capuchet repository and you see what's happening. Looks great. Yeah, we can do this. Oh. Yeah. This is all mock up. Yeah. Good. Let's, uh, no, <sighs> good, I'm done. Any other questions? No, not cool. for me. Back to Maya. Okay, so let's move on to the next subject, uh, which is still presented by Christoph, uh, about solving ARC64 Python modules. 
Yes. Um, to give a little bit of context, uh, we are looking for a demo on an embedded device, which is an ARC, uh, uh, an ARM, uh, I think, 7 uh, platform. So it's ARCH64, um, um, as we call it. And um, Zubin, maybe you can go a little bit more into details. Um, there will be an a uh, machine learning application, it will be using this and that Python modules, blah, 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 blah. And uh, we want to create container images for there for, for, for this uh, embedded device. So the question is, um, can we build um, ARM Python modules? Can we serve them somewhere? And uh, can we solve on that architecture? I, I split it up in two questions. It might be even three or four questions. I'm I'm unsure about that. Um, Frido, I think we have talked about multiple platforms before, and at least at some point in time, we had an idea how to do that, or we we started integrating that. Um, but this this is basically the the, the cluster of topics uh, we need to talk about a little bit more. Subin, would you like to to explain a little bit what's what's happening, what's on your mind? Um, let me just share that slide I um, shared with the other team. Oh. Yes, uh, Subin, keep in mind uh, this one is recorded going out to YouTube, right? Oh, okay. Uh, hmm. But do you think I can share that slide? Uh, that had oh yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, um, um, I mean the the repositories for planning Red Hat Summit Octo part of Red Hat Summit are public anyways. So uh, just don't go into all the money that we spent on on your yeah. hardware you have at home now. Yeah, it's not that expensive. But um, so, um, so anyway, this this is a slide I presented to another team. Uh, who are working on that. Um, um, Harshad, maybe I should present the screen. I, I think you're still presenting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the problem is that um, we have x86 containers, which are built on x86 servers, uh, which all of us are using. Uh, you cannot deploy x86 clusters on ARM hardware because they are different architectures. and if you also if you have python applications if they are pure python applications they work on any architecture but if you have any python application like tensorflow or pytorch numpy scipy they might have the c c++ uh, compiled code as shared objects they they are not uh, you know multi architecture capable so they are compiled on one architecture so to make it work on the other architecture, you need to compile that from scratch. This is like you know the basic uh, compiler uh, knowledge. Um, so we had a problem where we we want to create a pipeline, and the output of this pipeline is a container, and that has to be deployed on a edge device. Uh, so until now, uh, the definition of edge was something like an x86 device, but here the edge is even much even more lower profile device like a embedded device. So embedded devices, um, the one of the problems with embedded devices is that that particular board, which is manufactured by different vendors, they can only support a certain kernel. And because of that, uh, you can only install a certain set of uh, tools or libraries on it. And some of them don't even support containers. So at least for this particular project, we're choosing uh, the Raspberry Pi 4. And that on that, you can install Fedora. And you can run containers on that. Uh, the problem here is that the OpenShift cluster is on x86. So if you see the topmost black uh, rectangular box, that's Red Hat OpenShift Data Science. Uh, and that's on x86. And that's where the model training and we create, uh, happens. And once we have the model, we can put it onto S3 or PVC or wherever. That model has to be now containerized and deployed onto the edge device. And for the air, for that containerization to happen, uh, we need an ARM container. So that means that we need an ARM environment. 
So the third box, the third blue box with model container in it, basically repre represents an environment where you have a ARM host to create a model container, um, which can be deployed on the embedded device. And once the model container, which is the black box, is pushed to Quay, Quay supports multi-architecture containers, we can push it to the embedded device, which is the rightmost blue box. And that's the overall flow for deploying um, the AI model onto the embedded device. There are certain challenges here, uh, which is, seems obvious, is that um, when you're creating these containers, they have to be ARM containers. It needs ARM environment, and um, and those Python packages which you're using, if it is TensorFlow or PyTorch, if you go to PyPI, all those packages are for x86. They are not for ARM64. So the way the industry is dealing with this problem is that uh, they try to compile uh, all these Python packages on ARM and then they host it on their own PyPI for ARM. So you have companies like Linaro, ARM, who have their own PyPI um, repositories where you can, you know, some for some you have to pay, for some it's free. You can access these uh, uh, packages. Uh, so for thought to support it, and again, this is just a hypothesis. I haven't thought much about it. Uh, we, we need to have um, all these packages for ARM on our own um, package repository. And we need to build all these packages on ARM so that uh, we can take a arm base image from you know um, a fedora arm base image or whatever and then put these packages in them and create these container environments where uh, the ai ml inference application can work on the embedded device uh, so that's basically the gist of um, the problem and some hypothesis on a possible solution and how thought uh, needs to be expanded uh, for taking care of ARM uh, packages, Python packages, and ARM containers, and the pipelining, and all that. Uh, just one um, additional comment. The higher level that we don't see on this presentation, or the, the workflow we imagine, is um, pretty well known. Uh, we have an open data hub. Um, the data scientist is having some data, uh, creating his uh, her Jupyter notebooks, um, creating a model, um, testing it. All that stuff is happening on Intel on on x86. Uh, but when the uh, data scientist persona is creating a release, our build pipelines kick in and create that container image with that model that we see in the middle of uh, Zubin's screen right now, um, going to deploy all that stuff. Um, extra complication is that uh, somewhere in that picture, the Meteor thing is, um, but I think that will all happen on, um, on Intel. Um, so what we really should look at is, if the model has been released, um, stored on S3 or wherever it is, and we kick on the uh, build pipeline targeting ARM architecture, what do we need to do? There should be an Tamos advice during that build so that we know, um, or so that we can show here's Toth knowledge, Toth guidance when the build itself. Um, maybe I don't know if we can optimize these models uh, using neural magic or something like that. Um, but obviously, uh, we need to advise on ARM, Python modules, and we need to build targeting ARM. Yes. Thoughts, comments, ideas? Um, Frido, I, I, I really can't remember. I think we have had that uh, somewhere in our minds. 
Uh, yes. Uh, one thing uh, before two specific uh, parts. Uh, there are ongoing efforts, and linear builds are available on PyPI now. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, I posted a link. Uh, it's release candidate of TensorFlow specific for Arc 64. So the, the strategy here, so, sorry to interrupt, um, the strategy is, as we have seen with Intel TensorFlow and GPU, CPU TensorFlow, uh, put everything on the one Python index and um, uh, partic uh, uh, partition by name of the package itself, right? Mm -hmm. So this highly depends, uh, like, so what we can, what we can do uh, if uh, TensorFlow will stay uh, like Arc sixty four builds of TensorFlow will stay in that TensorFlow Arc sixty four package, then we can in advisor pipeline say whenever you see TensorFlow as a direct dependency or indirect dependency it doesn't matter if you see TensorFlow in the dependency graph and you are resolving for Arc sixty four then do not use TensorFlow, but use TensorFlow Arc 64, similarly as we do for GPU enabled builds and things like that. Exactly. That is basically what we do by now for, for Intel and GPU and CPU, right? We, we just mm -hmm. rewrite the package name. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the problem uh, as of now is that if we want to support new architecture, that means solvers will need to run on that specific architecture. And uh, that means like solver containers will need to be built for Arc64. And uh, we will need to sync these results specifically for Arc64. So uh, I don't know about availability of such a cluster. Um from an from an solver point of view the 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 key component is basically is it, it's basically pip that we need right uh, pip needs the the uh, slow down pip in that arm 64 solver needs to be aware i'm running on arm 64 and and do its thing uh, correct uh, there's no platform dependency that we have in, in the solver itself? Uh, the, the solver itself can stay untouched. Like uh, we are reusing whatever is implemented in PIP as of now. Mm -hmm. So uh, the code of TOTS solver uh, can stay untouched. And once we run TOTS solver on Arc64, it automatically, like the PIP logic automatically detects, okay, I'm running Arc64, it automatically picks the relevant will file and uh, analyzes it with respect to dependencies. Uh, that's like ideal scenario. Uh, Uh, another scenario would be to somehow adjust that solver to be aware that even if you are running on x86, uh, we want specifically information about dependencies for uh, ARC64. But it's something worse a spike. I don't know what uh, will need to be done on that front because it would need to be somehow instrumented to download the correct wheel file. And as we are interested in just in metadata, we don't, we don't need to actually, uh, we, we need to. Uh, uh, could you say that, could you say the idea again? So, so we basically do a cross platform, cross architecture resolution. We run on Intel and tell PIP to solve for ART. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what will need to be done on that front, like this worse as pipe, because it's somehow not fitting to to the correct to the current uh, tot solver design. And there can be issues in some specific cases uh, with respect to metadata aggregated. Yeah, and feels feels dangerous because if we are telling. Um... 
if we are telling pip to install, I don't know, pgsql for ARM, I'm pretty sure it tries to compile a native extension, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, so is it, it yes, sorry. yeah, uh, I think it could fail the re resolution because it cannot compile that native extension. But if we run the same, um, if we run the same pip install pgsql on an ARM container in an ARM cluster, it might be successful because it's not even trying to install the native extension because it figured out, oh damn, it's ARM, I'm not gonna do it. So the result might be different, right? Yes, so uh, ideally, like the best scenario would be to have ARM cluster available and run ARM specific solvers so we aggregate data. Correct. It feels to me like we should head out maybe to the um, Fedora community and uh, find an ARM machine, uh, maybe a, maybe an OpenShift cluster on ARM. No, uh, Zubin, there was a comment with regards to availability of OpenShift, right? It's not available on ARM. Yeah, it's not available. Uh, they have some issues to fix. Um, so they are saying probably 4.9 or 4.10 OpenShift, where it would be available. Okay, but doesn't matter. An ARM host with Podman should be good enough to run the solver containers and do some solving, right, Frido? Uh, sorry, say it again. An ARM host with Podman should be good enough to run the solver container image and just do some solving, right? Mm -hmm. So we have like solver documents available, mm -hmm. we can sync them. And yes, so uh, we will need to add support to, to the database, like mm -hmm. having a uh, notion that if you are resolving for ARC, then uh, take dependency information specifically for, for ARC 64. And solver document uh, platform aware, do we, do we carry the, the CPU architecture in a solver document? Mm -hmm. I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. Should be part of the hardware part of the uh, runtime environment, right? Mm -hmm. But worth to, worth to double check. Okay. And also it might be good to think if we want to have tables specific for ARC64, because if we think it's the same tables as Intel ones, it will add overhead. And besides that, like IDs will go crazy. It, they will go up very quickly. But it's an implementation detail for that. Yes. And also indices will, will be affected, like the whole flow. Okay. Um, so uh, coming back to the summit um, demo itself, um, for the uh, Christmas time frame, we are targeting just the Intel uh, part of the whole story. Um, but um, yeah, as Zubin pointed out, there there is a little bit of stuff to be done if you really want to advise towards the ARM architecture. That is why I think it's worth um, having really a look at all that stuff. Um, in the uh, show notes, I have noted at least three action items uh, that we could check on. Um, I try to transform them into GitHub issues so that we can work on it, right? You don't work if you don't have any issue. Um, and uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand if you want to do something uh, on that fancy uh, hardware platform. Uh, ARCH64 is, by the way, what's in Raspberry Pi 3 and 4 and 0, I guess. Right, Zubin? Um, I think it stands for ARM architecture for 64 bits. Yes, so, and it's it's in these Raspberry Pis, um, I yeah. think. Yeah, 
and um, that uh, Jetson thing that uh, Francesco, you have one of these Nvidia Jetsons, right? Yes. Yes, that's Intel. No, that should be also ARM. Ah, okay. Yes. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Uh, good. Any any other thoughts, comments, um, ideas? Uh, the latest specification of Mini Linux 2014 has ARM64 included. And we have a container image for um, builds. So once the community uh, slowly starts adopting that new PEP, um, we expect the community to start having ARM uh, mini Linux packages on the PyPI. Uh, I, but I don't see that adoption widespread yet. But once it happens, it should mm. because I think we are at an inflection point where it should happen. Mm. Then uh, this probably would get solved um, by itself. So is there like a package list of things that we should prioritize and and maybe push forward? Some some things that we should build on our own. I think we have a list somewhere from Francesco or someone about the top uh, 15 or 25 Python AI ML packages. Ah, maybe, yes. Yeah, just go to each of them and maybe put an issue saying that we want ARM builds. Uh, because each of those um, communities, they, they have some cash to do an ARM build themselves. They're currently doing on x86 on using I don't know, Circle CI or whatever. Mm. So if my, again, it's just a hypothesis, but if we nudge them to support it, I'm sure they would support that on Circle CI. And slowly we will see more and more packages on IPI with ARM. Mm -hmm. By the way, ARC64 was discussed on TensorFlow SIG build meeting. It looks like they are interested in that as well. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like uh, Fedora is supporting it too. So maybe the chances to get an ARM Fedora thing on the ARM, uh, sorry, on the Fedora cloud is, is is high. Let's see. Uh, generally, the problem with embedded devices were that they were very diverse and you could not standardize them. Uh, but I feel that, again, just a hypothesis that we have reached an uh, inflection point where there might be some standardization. If more people use the same RPI Raspberry Pi 4 board, then the number of people using the same kind of packages are very high in frequency. Um, have you talked to the Fedora community? I mean, they are active in the ARM because of Raspberry and blah, blah, blah. And they have an IoT spin too. Um, so. so it feels like they are pretty active. Do you, do you had any interaction with them? Uh, I just had ch chat with the lead, Pete Robinson, and what I understand is that they are, of course, building Fedora ARM containers. So that means that they are individually building all those uh, RPMs also for ARM. Mm. And uh, so I think that stack is all well taken care of, the compiler stack and all that. So the next step is, of course, the Python. Uh, because the Python stack depends on the compiler stack uh, and all that. Uh, Peter Robinson is null route. I don't know. About. Yeah, uh, his his IRC handle or his GitHub handle or his Pagur handle. I'm not I sure think... about this. Yes. Okay. Ah, that's interesting. All that stuff is uh, pretty much interesting, from at least for me. Even though I hate hardware, I think it's interesting to see that um, adoption of all that open source stuff in in the embedded world. 
good. Other thoughts, other other ideas, other questions, other asks. Good. So um, as I said, I I think I noted a few things. Um, Pep and others also noted things on that topic. Uh, I try to turn them into. Um, I try to turn them into um, issues on GitHub. Um, yes, and then we're gonna groom, refine, and plan them accordingly. Uh, I think the next uh, planning session we're gonna do next week, right? Um, actually, well, it, it it was supposed to be yesterday, but it was cancelled. So in theory, it's in two weeks, but we can. We can. Do a, yeah, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, yes we can. Good. Cool. Uh, I'm happy about a arch six four. Uh, Maya, back to you. Okay. So um, do we need to develop on building and delivering arch six four Python modules, or are we good? I think we just um, do it in a different way. We just do it like this. It disappeared, so it's just a headline of the former topic. So I'm good. OK, so I think we're done for the session. Are there any questions? OK, so thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.